And this morning we are here with Dylan Keene, who is going to chat with us about southern flounders and um, the flounder fishery and some recent uh, management efforts to help rebuild a declining population of this species. So with that, I'm going to let Dylan tell you a little bit about flounders. So I'm, I'm Dylan Keene. I'm a PhD student at the University of South Alabama as well as a researcher here at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab and I've been here for a number of years and researched all different kinds of fish uh, during my time here but have settled on flounder being the species that I wanted to study for my graduate work and um, really that's all kind of come full circle right at a time where uh, a lot of management action has been taken on these fish and so uh, the flounder populations have been declining for a number of years um, really everywhere uh, not just here in Alabama and so it's been kind of a, a, a journey to to describe that and see um, over time what what sort of regulations are making a difference and uh, the regulations I guess uh, we can kind of backtrack a little bit and and talk about how that kind of came about and why that was uh, was needed and so there was a independent assessment that was done by Dr. Sean Powers and Dr. Mark Albans at the University of South Alabama who collaborated with John Maresca at uh, Alabama Marine Resources and basically uh, synthesized a bunch of fisheries dependent data from the catch landings, both recreational and commercial, that included uh, age and some other things and effort. Um, and then also some fisheries independent data from the gillnet survey, 17 year gillnet survey that the, the state had and brought it all into a model that was able to look at um, the stock recruit re relationship as well as a number of other factors. And uh, the way the model output works is you can look at different management scenarios and what the output would be for your spawning potential ratio, which is a, a, a benchmark statistic that fisheries uses to kind of monitor the health of the population uh, and its spawning potential and settle on increasing the size limit from 12 inches to 14 inches uh, would bring that fishing shore down just enough to get that ideal uh, spawning potential ratio. And so the previous size limits and bag limits were t uh, 10 for recreational was you were allowed to keep 10 flounder per day at 12 inches. That's now moved up to five uh, per day at 14 inches. And then as well as previously, the commercial harvest was allowed to take as many as they wanted uh, as long as they met that 12 inch minimum size limit. That's been reduced back to 40 per person or per vessel per day um, with that 14 inch minimum size limit as well as a November closure and so that November closure is to kind of protect the big females as they migrate offshore to spawn so these fish have a really really uh, complicated life history um, and well I guess all fish kind of are complicated in their own unique ways but flounder have a lot of different uh, things and characteristics uh, that make them unique and, and a difficult fish to manage and so the big females actually spend most of their time here inshore uh, throughout the warm months from spring, summer, and then if they are mature, they will migrate offshore in the fall to meet up with the males, uh, which are much smaller and occupy different habitats, mainly offshore, and they spawn throughout the months of uh, probably late November, December, in still unknown locations. That's one of the goals uh, of a lot of different scientific researchers is to isolate where these fish are spawning and hopefully be able to, to use that information to our advantage to figure out where the larvae, because we can talk about kind of how uh, their life history works a little bit, but uh, they have a pelagic larvae, so the fish go offshore to spawn. And so any variation in ocean currents is going to dictate where these larvae may end up. And so uh, southern flounder, basically after they hatch, they go you know, they're pelagic for about 30 or 40 days. They look <clears throat> just like normal fish do at this point. Um, and then around the 30, 40 day mark, they'll start to metamorphosize. So the right eye will actually rotate to the other side. I don't know if we have a few so, examples. But, yeah, uh, so we tell a little bit about the life history and show some of these specimens that um, were collected at, as Dylan mentioned, they're going to be offshore, and these would be collected not, you know, in a in a trawl net, but in a plankton net. Yep, um, in a plankton tow is so where you typically to, find this, and that's what they. Closer. This is um, 
juvenile flounder and you can see an eye on that side and an eye on this side. So Dylan was just explaining how the eye migrates. So I don't know if you want to show the x-ray. Yeah, and so that right eye, because this is a left eyed flounder, will migrate to uh, over a period of about 10 to 15 days to the other side. Um, and so the flounder will then look like it's adult form from there on after, um, which is makes it a demersal fish. So it'll actually lay flat. And right about the same time that it completes metamorphosis is where it'll settle um, inshore, which shortly after that, it will determine its sex. Um, and so at this point, it, it doesn't have a determined sex yet. And there's actually a number of factors that influence the sex of these fish, temperature being one of them. And so they have a characteristic called environmental sex determination, which makes their life history uh, quite difficult uh, for managers to figure out because the female is the one that is only really going to get big enough to get to that harvestable size. And so uh, if the temperature is too high, really above 23 degrees Celsius, or too low, below about 18 degrees Celsius, um, all up to like 95% of those fish will can be males. Um, and only the female genotype exhibits that characteristic. So if it's a genetic male, it's going to be a male. But if it's a genetic female and the environmental conditions are less than ideal, it's going to turn into a male, which is a problem because it'll never get big enough to enter the fishery. And so that's kind of something that we're learning more about uh, still to this day. It's, a, it's uh, something that hatchery folks are looking at um, with their spawning fish uh, in captivity and to look at other ways to, you know, maybe maximize the female ratio. But um, it could be, you know, part of the reason that we've had declines uh, in the species is related to this characteristic potentially as well as overfishing because we're overfishing those females which are a little bit more rare in terms of uh, you know being able to create them naturally and so uh, how long does the temperature um, have that I mean how long does it take for that to um, have that effect on the it's a relatively small it's window exchange. so it's somewhere between 50 and 75 millimeters so you know between a one and two inch fish, that's when it's going to go through that sexual determination phase. Well, but then the, the change, if they have environmental conditions that, that prompt that. Mm -hmm. this, so it's a, it's a, like the time window? For, for the sex determination? For the sex change. Uh, it's, it's pretty quick. I mean, so they are undetermined and then will essentially determine and temperature has an influence on that. But there's some other, other evidence too that suggests that maybe stress uh, is another one and so for one thing they found is that flounder that were spawned in blue tanks would all turn into males wow. and which is wow. interesting and Surprising. you know ecologically the reason for behind that um, and this is just you know one of my theories I guess is that you know if the temperature is less than ideal or more variable along the coast where fish settle where it's either hotter or warmer um, in that higher salinity blue water it's going to benefit that fish to be a male um, because it's already kind of out there in that area and you know can live offshore versus kind of give folks an idea um, geographically if they're not familiar with this area yeah. um, where we're talking about them spawning and then um, and then where they are typically harvested so that's right. Mobile Bay and then we've got more of the Gulf here yeah and so this is uh, a map like you said of Mobile Bay and so which is just outside our windows here. Yep. It's so cool. we are on the east end of Dauphin Island on the north side. So this is Mobile Bay um, and the, the Alabama coast here. So what you'll typically find in terms of, of young, newly settled flounder, where they want to kind of end up and be to where they want to first you know, start their lives is in these lower salinity habitats like the Mobile Delta, the Mobile River. There's a few tidal, tidally influenced rivers here along the western shore. Um, Dog River, Fowl River, there's an industrial canal as well as, you know, a lot of areas along the eastern shore as well, Fish River um, and some of these other places where, you know, that's kind of where these uh, juveniles want to end up in these marsh habitats, protected low salinity areas um, so they can, you know, kind of start feeding and, and going through their, their process and these fish actually grow really, really quickly. So a female um, that is spawned basically right now um, by next year, this time will be close to 12 inches, which is the previously harvested 
uh, minimum size. And, uh, and so they will typically stay more inshore, the females? They will, yeah. And, especially what, and the males at some point during that year yep. of development will go offshore? Yep. And so kind of what we're seeing in this data is that um, the females will actually overwinter during, after that first year uh, inshore and in one of these river systems or in the delta or, you know, bayou area over there, um, whereas the males will start to migrate out with the mature females. Um, so males uh, mature much quicker, much quicker than the, than the females do, uh, and they kind of want to get to that offshore area where they're going to be able to... How far offshore are we talking? Here's Mobile Bay right here, north central Gulf of Mexico. So we've captured them in trawl surveys in November this time, anywhere from 10 to 50 miles offshore. And so really, we assume that they're spawning in areas that has optimal bathymetry or some sort of structure or habitat benefit that is going to, you know, help them be successful in their spawning efforts. But we really don't know. And that's, uh, there's some research going on on the East Coast right now where they're actually trying to satellite tag really, really big flounder and track them uh, offshore. And, you know, one of my projects that I'm looking at is actually getting, tracking that migration of the mature females. And so, uh, we can talk a little bit about that with the so acoustics. Let's just kind of um, reiterate that the females will then move offshore in order to spawn. Yep. Um, and that's happening this time of year. Yep. And that's why we close the season for the month of November to protect those big female spawners. And that's still kind of an area of active research. How the you know the the site selection of the the spawning grounds, whether that's some sort of bottom structure or you know the kind of bottom that they're gathering around or whether it's salinity difference there's a lot of fresh water flowing into mobile bay or whether that maybe it's just a, kind of a signal but right and um, so that's unclear that's kind of the next step actually and maybe it's a, hopefully a question that i'll get to look into uh, further in my career but you know, right now we're already finding some incredible things with uh, tracking this migration. Um, you would assume that all the mature females this time of year would begin that migration and go out there to spawn, but really only about 20 or 30 percent of them do it every year. Huh. Um, and so there's a lot of really, really big fish staying behind um, in the estuaries and bays. And so we're not really sure why that is, because um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that you know, if they were to be spawning in here, they wouldn't be very successful because uh, they have these pelagic larvae. That salinity is less than 10 parts per thousand. There's pretty much 100% mortality. So there's still some questions. So, you know, you might um, wonder if maybe they don't spawn every year, like maybe a particular individual only, you could only expect them to spawn once every two years or Right. Maybe, um, I mean, this, that's just speculation, but some of the questions does, that arise. Yeah, it does seem like the most likely mm -hmm. individual to make that migration and go out is a first year spawner. So about a 16, 17 inch fish is going to be the most likely. Maybe if that fish does it and survives and make it back, I mean, it's incredibly taxing for this fish because if you watch their uh, movements throughout the majority of the year they're very resident in in certain areas they'll move a lot um, in a day you know up and down with tides and um, probably in relation to their feeding habits but they're going to be in one general area whereas when they do this migration they're up and and moving a lot as, as much as 10 kilometers a day so let's talk about how you know that how you can um, understand the movements of an individual and so we have a really really cool technology now um, with these Innova C products where uh, we can use an acoustic tag. And so this is um, an acoustic tag. If you were to take the magnet off of this tag, it would begin pinging. And so you can program these um, for different rates and different powers and everything. And I program <coughs> ours to ping every two minutes on a really, really high power. And so each one has a unique ID and we've placed these hydrophones right here, about 70, 75 of them. Throughout Mobile Bay, there's a gate that goes across the mouth and gates in the bridge there. It so basically encapsulates the bay to where they can't leave without being detected by one of these. But not only that, we have more receivers in other areas into the rivers and up north and, 
and all these different areas that can track these fish every single time they come by them and these tags last a full year and so you're able to get a lot of data back from each fish um, thousands and thousands of detections and so it's a really really neat thing to see how they move and utilize different habitats uh, prior to spawning during the spawn and then post spawn and another really really cool thing that uh, I found doing this is that the fish that do migrate offshore um, actually a few of them come back and they come back to the exact same rivers that they left from and so so how long <coughs> how long are you seeing them um, gone um, from the bay about six months yeah in total from where we tag them to them moving and then them getting back to exactly where we tagged them in terms of being absent from the bay um, about four or five months some start to show back up in February um, not very many and if they do show back up in February a lot of times they'll go back out they realize it's a little too early so you're targeting the <coughs> large females with the tagging yes efforts yep um, and so how many of those uh, fish do you have tagged um, after this year I have 225 with the acoustic tags and about 800 with uh, these marker capture tags and so this is just an external marker every fish is going to get one of these it's got a unique number as well as our phone number so if you catch uh, a tag flounder you just call the number and I call you back and give you a report on the fish and uh, <coughs> we've had quite a few of those um, just to the fish I tagged this fall, eight of them have been recaptured. Are you tagging additional <coughs> fish with those or you're, that's just a duplication with the, um, the other tags? Um, it is a duplication, so the acoustic fish will get those, but we're tagging uh, a bunch of other fish as well. And so, so we, did, how many? we tagged 300 total this year um, and 60 of them got acoustic transmitters and then the rest just are regular mark recapture tags which still helps us track movement but you you know you only get information back if the fish is recaptured right so just to explain a little bit of the um rationale for the different tagging techniques these are a lot a lot less expensive yes much less so, expensive. well i mean the tags themselves are a lot less expensive there's still the um the effort that goes into right. capturing and tagging them right um but the information return is um not at the information return is not as high correct um so it would it would rely on someone catching the fish and reporting it so right. this is you know one method of of tagging and they they're you know kind of like earrings like you would pretty much yeah we call it jewelry <laughs> we um, give them a little piece of jewelry well these What's the, what's the cost on the acoustic tags? So those are about $400 um, for each tag. And you know, the benefit of that though, is that you get recaptures every two minutes if it's by a receiver. And so you can treat that as recapture and, and track it that way. Um, but so you know, you don't get growth. You don't get uh, a lot of these other things that you would get with an actual re uh, mark recapture. Mm -hmm. um, plus you get the cost of the receivers and Mm -hmm. the effort that it takes to maintain that array like mm -hmm. I'm pretty much busy all year round either with the tagging or going out and servicing these receivers so the battery in those lasts about a year so mm -hmm. you got to go through them all and download them and then you know replace the batteries and maybe move them around if you want to see something different uh, which we did in 2021 to yeah. hopefully try to track what the fish that are not leaving are doing what is the how close do they have to get to the receiver to make it ping um it varies you know with sea state condition because it's essentially a sound mm -hmm. transmitted um but in ideal conditions anywhere from five to six hundred meters uh, in less than ideal conditions about 200 to 300 meters and you can set that difference to a certain extent right yeah so for example if you wanted um like a broader um picture of how many were approaching a certain area you could get that by setting that radius um, bigger and if you wanted um, you know to make that more specific to a location then you can make that radius smaller. right and you can do that with the power of the tags actually you can program them for high mm -hmm. powers or low powers and then yeah. you can actually do some really really cool stuff uh, dr baker's lab 
is doing some really neat uh, stuff over in BioLabattery using a VPS function on that, so an actual positioning system where you get those receivers to triangulate, all overlap. And so you can get uh, detections down to like less than, you know, a meter mm -hmm. and tell exactly where a fish is um, for fine scale movement studies. And it also kind of affects the battery life, doesn't it? It does, yes. Yeah. And so... Just kind of explaining some of the practical considerations yeah, with how you tag <clears throat> and why you make the decisions about how you, how you set the right Tags. you know i could have set them for to ping every five minutes on a lower power and maybe got two or three years out of those tags but for the purposes of what i want to look at which is tracking try to track the true number of migratory uh mature females is setting that ping rate really really fast so every two minutes to ensure that they can't swim through the gate without being detected mm -hmm. uh, and on a really high power so it's putting out a lot of power every two minutes and you know which should be heard by any of the receivers in the area and they are i mean we're getting uh I still question whether or not the 20, 30 percent is the right number, but after seeing what uh, other people are doing this similar studies in their area, and they've found much lower than that even. And so I think it's you know pretty accurate. Um, most of the individuals that are leaving are doing so through the mouth of the bay. They're not leaving um, through the Dolphin Island Bridge or going into the sound at all. And this is strictly for individuals that are tagged in Mobile Bay. It could be you know, based on what this data shows, I think it's going to be very, very uh, site specific. So if you were to tag these fish in Mississippi, the dynamic would probably be different um, in different areas in Florida because they seem to be extremely resident. Mm. They know where they are. They know where they want to be and where they want to get back to. And so that was the most astounding thing to me in the first year to see fish from each individual river system leave and then come back to those river systems and not a different one mm -hmm. or not anywhere else because other states have these receivers set up too and if our flounder were to go or come back in those areas uh, we'd be able to know that as well because I reach out to those people and we have not had a single detection oh, from wow. any of our fish even uh, as close as Pascagoula. Wow. Yep. So um, do you have a hypothesis about why you're only seeing about 20 percent of the spawning size flounders? Um, you know I don't I don't have necessarily a good one, no. Either they have figured out a way to adaptively spawn in the bay, which I think is probably the least likely um, explanation, or like you said, they're selectively spawning by year because it is such uh, a taxing mm -hmm. you know, event for them to gather enough resources and make these huge migrations for a fish that's pretty sedentary most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the predation, the mortality, everything associated with that is probably really, really high. Um, and a lot of them probably don't make it back. Mm -hmm. And so uh, after having done that for a year, they may need more than a year again to get enough you know, nutrients back. And when did or they you, may, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. or they may choose to, to devote a lot of resources to growth in the following year and get bigger mm -hmm. um, versus reproduction. Do you have any sense of, um, of the return rate? Yeah, it's very, very low. I mean, we, the first two years of the project, it was really only designed to look at the out migration. And so mm -hmm. the tags only lasted about 200 days. Uh -huh. And so uh, we just kind of captured this towards the end of the tag life. And we we're like, well, that's really cool. Let's, uh, so we upped the tag uh, life for the next year. And uh, we really haven't gotten a lot of returners come back through the mouth gate, which I speculate uh, could be okay. We'll see, because I haven't got to download the rest of the receivers. and. Um, it seemed like they oriented back to the Dolphin Island Bridge when they, the returners, when they first came back. Huh. And so that could give some indication that maybe they're spawning out southwest of here and then coming back around the west end of Dolphin Island when they do come back and coming up that way. Um, but really we'll see. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited if this wind would die down. I'm yeah. going to go out there and get all the receivers and get all the data. And so look you at are it. seeing some of them return to their, the, you know, the, the rivers that they, yep. um, they, they have. So, blew my mind. I mean, yeah, but, for a little flatfish uh, to be able to find its way. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. So, but you're, you're like the length of the study, you feel like it, you, you, you maybe don't have a confident answer to what, you know, what percentage of them will return? Well, we will for, so we, that uh, longer tag life was implemented last year and I tagged 75 uh, big females with, with that tag. I just haven't got all the data downloaded yet oh, okay. for that year. <clears throat> So you had but, mentioned um, the uh, <coughs> maintenance on the so the the kind of the system is called the array with mm -hmm. the um, the 
acoustic devices, the receivers. Um, so, and you mentioned getting data from them, but they will um, send data, right? They don't, tran there are certain ones that can transmit, mm -hmm. um, and that's actually kind of what we use to gate the mouth of the bay, because mm -hmm. uh, that model, you would need to attach it to a piece of structure for it to be, you know, where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. There's no structures in the mouth of the bay, so we use a fancier version of that. Uh, that has an acoustic release that you can talk to and you can check how many detections are on it and a number of other things um, and they also have internal tags that sync up and talk to each other so they'll mm -hmm. talk to adjacent receivers and um, it's been a really really neat technology to be able to gate you know passes and stuff like that that you wouldn't normally be able to do uh -huh. which mobile bay sets up ideally for that i'm really lucky to be able to work in an area that you can essentially close it in to be able to track true migration numbers. So you mentioned that somebody is using satellite tags, yep. which are um, even more expensive than the acoustic and tags. clunky, yeah. <laughs> and they also require um, like enough of a signal if you can, you know, sort of imagine that, that if the fish is under a certain depth of water, there's not going to be a signal from the tagged fish to the satellite, so you get no data. So what kind of data return are they getting? Are they just when the fish are inshore and they're in shallow water? Or? Um, you know, they they had they have a very well funded study. Uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure where they're getting it all from for this particular uh, study, but I think they're using archival pop off tags, and so oh, okay. <clears throat> it'll actually archive like depth information and, mm -hmm. and some other swimming speed and some other stuff like that. But then you pop it off and you get a one-time location for like you know five grand oh, okay. or whatever. It's really yeah. expensive, but uh -huh. if you were to get the funding for it and do a number of this, you could really figure out some some really important things. One of the issues they're you know they're kind of running into is that only ten or twenty percent of their fish are actually migrating offshore, so they're popping a lot of them off in the months that they should be offshore spawning, and they're seeing some in the bay or oh. uh, in some of those other areas. But they have got some really cool information. Uh, mm -hmm. that may indicate where they're spawning there on the east coast which their continental shelf is much closer so you know five ten miles mm -hmm. is probably where they're going to want to be spawning whereas here that's about 50 55 miles mm -hmm. um, if you talk about the shelf break we don't know maybe they could be utilizing uh, all the artificial reefs that we have out there is another thing that i've thought about uh, their spawning dynamics could have changed over time but uh I am hoping to answer that question i've been working with some spear fishermen as well who uh, target these fish throughout different months of the year and going to go out with them maybe this winter time mm -hmm. and they'll hopefully be able to tell me what they see and that's another really cool thing that I figured out is that there's probably actually an offshore resident contingent of the population that's much older. Um, you know, once they, a, maybe some there are some resident females out there? There are yeah just what the what it seems to be five and six year olds which we do not see any of in the inshore hmm. areas um, and you can run those otoliths through the mass spec laser that's at the university and you can yeah. look at the different ratios of strontium and barium to calcium and are check. you doing any of that yeah yeah um reed nelson who's one of our previous mm -hmm. phd students um now professor is he came down and kind of helped me work through it because that's something that he did for his dissertation and so i've been uh gathering more and more of those from the spear fishermen these big females sampling their tournaments and going out with them wow. and everything to so the otoliths are the ear stones of the fish, um, and it and it's like a free floating floating like calcium um, uh, stone um, that is helps the fish orient in the water, and so they can take those out and they can section them and get growth because they have rings, kind of like the rings of a tree. Yep. But what Dylan is talking about is a um, process where they look at the, um, the chemicals that are being um, incorporated into those rings as they grow. So they can match the, that chemical signature with different water bodies that they have a chemical signature identified for. And so they can tell where that fish was growing at that particular part of its life. Um, if they have the, the chemical signature for that water body. That's really interesting. It is really interesting. Flounder have these really beautiful otoliths and probably because of the areas that they occupy during the different times of the year, they lay down these really dark bands every winter and so you can uh, very easily tell how old mm. they are. 
Um, but then you, you know, when it comes to using the laser, uh, you can start in the very core of the otolith and go out through its life, basically, mm -hmm. uh, and use that laser to ablate the surface and then separate all the different chemicals by mass, which then speciates them, and then wow. and see all the different chemicals. We're actually going to look and see. We got some fish from the hatchery to see if there's any sort of hatchery signature that you could potentially use on, mm -hmm. on wild fish to look at potentially you know what the implications are and how many of those fish are surviving uh, from the hatchery because the hatchery program that we have here is doing an incredible job probably the best in the country at, at, at spawning uh, flounders in captivity uh, and getting them released back into the population. So you um, kind of at the beginning talked about some of the potential pressures that may be contributing to this decline in the flounders that we've been you know seeing the population we've been seeing in shore and just to kind of show folks a flounder again um, this one obviously does not meet the size requirement for harvest but flounders this is one of our preserved species that we use to I mean preserved specimens that we use to teach about um, animals with but the um, I mean people like to eat them flounders they are, are very tasty. A, you know a target fish species so um, you know, what is the fishing pressure on these? And fishing, yeah, it's very, very high, and it comes from a number of different sources. So hook and line, obviously, is one for recreational. Um, so this is mostly inshore? Inshore, yeah, that's where most Ra of the Rather are. than, like, taking a boat and going yeah. offshore and fishing for flounder. Yeah, that's a very minimal effort. There's only a select few people that know how to target uh, those offshore flounder and do mm -hmm. do it. Um, but mainly comes from hook and line, uh, and then gigging effort is really, really high as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't have good quantification in terms of numbers and effort for that. I think that's something that should be looked at and done uh, over time. But, you know, part of the thing that makes these fish so susceptible is that at night they're going to come up into really shallow mm -hmm. areas um, where they're just, you know, really, really easy to gig, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the technology and stuff. It hasn't scaled well. For them with that because then now that people have these shallow water specialist boats with uh led light systems that can light up an entire marsh and and see well i uh, will mention that too that these fish are really good at camouflage they are really good at camouflage but and, you know I mean, uh, people obviously do find them but right. this is kind of an interesting but that, that's part of it and that's that's flounders. actually something that's you know unique to the history of alabama and everything gigging has long been a way for people to go out and harvest flounder and there's nothing wrong with it uh, at all and so it's actually a really cool thing but you know it does put a lot of pressure on the fishery so does the hook and line and then uh, gill nets uh, which is a you know that's kind of being phased out a little bit now um, mm -hmm. but it you know puts a lot of pressure and especially for people that used to do it during the month of November when these fish are moving because mm -hmm. you can get bunches of them. them yeah yeah and they're all going to be the big females that are trying to get out there and spawn mm -hmm. um, and they get harvested but now i think you know we've seen a pretty significant recovery um with the implications of the management that happened in 2019 and so i've kind of been on the water every fall tagging yeah. since mm -hmm. then and so 2019 was really tough um we worked hard every day to tag about four flounder mm -hmm. for in eight hours mm -hmm. and then uh 2020 came around and uh, it seemed like it was a good spawn because we were seeing a lot more uh, juveniles and that was the first year we started seeing a bunch of overwintering mm -hmm. individuals in a lot of the rivers. Um, and then 2021 got here and it was like, what happened? You know, mm -hmm. flounder are everywhere. Um, seemed like, you know, the magic cure is here. It all mm -hmm. worked. Um, you know, I still would urge caution for people with regards to that. This was another pretty good year. Seen, you know, a lot of juveniles again. So hopefully we see another good year next year. But we don't know what the sustainability of that is quite yet. And, uh, you know, we want to get to a point where there's a lot more of those two, three, four-year-olds in the system um, because those are going to be your big spawners. And hopefully if the offshore residency thing holds true, we can rebuild that offshore population. And that's going to be probably one of the biggest things uh, to have that cryptic biomass that's capable of spawning much longer, much earlier with big genetics. So um, let's just kind of talk a little bit about how the research informs the management. So um, the Dolphin Island Sea Lab is, um, you know, we're, these researchers are doing academic research um, and then this this research informs the management decisions of regulators. So the Sea Lab does not 
um, make regulations. Nope. But but they um, you know they they do research on a lot of questions that can inform targeted management practices, such as a November closure that protects the females as they um, move offshore to spawn, um, and the the people who are making the management decisions use that, uh, you know, ideally they're using that research to inform those management decisions. So you feel like the, um, the protections that were established in 2019, you're already seeing some population rebound from that? Right. Um, you know, it could, we, we attribute it to those regulation chains. We're not, a, you know, 100% sure about that. The environmental conditions have probably been what I would call ideal the past few years and with this uh, La Nina pattern that we've been in. Um, but like you said, with in terms of uh, science informing management, that's something we're really lucky to have here uh, in the state of Alabama is this really dynamic you know, organization that manages the fisheries and takes informed scientific uh, information and, and implicates it directly into management and can do it fast. You know, the regulation changes uh, in terms of the size, minimum size and everything, that was a direct result of the assessment that Dr. Powers helped lead um, to plug all the known information that we had on these fish into a model that could give you different scenarios. And uh, that was the one that popped out for the goals we were trying to meet. And uh, So let's also explain that the um, regulatory agency that Dylan is talking about right now is the state um, agency. Yeah, and Alabama so, Marine Yeah, resources. so that would be for Alabama state waters, but yeah. um, these fish are also migrating out beyond Alabama state waters, which would be um, federal, U.S. federal waters. Um, but it, it looks like the, the important management, the important geographic area to manage can be done within the state waters. Right, and if if the data, you know, continues to hold this pattern where it looks like fish are resident, Alabama fish, you know, are pretty much Alabama fish, that would probably hold true for a lot of other different areas. And so it's probably best to manage at a state level for, you know, the fishery that you want to create. Mm -hmm. um, but there is also um, federal regulation. Yes. In federal and waters. There, there needs to be because of what you said, where these fish are spawning. And there's likely a lot of mixing going on out there with the fish that are migrating out there and spawning, you know. We don't fully understand that yet and hopefully we will one day but uh you know that's that's how the dynamic is for the gulf too and that's going to be different for the east coast which is a different genetic stock so there's actually two genetic stocks of southern flounder there's a break in the population around the florida keys where there are none and so you know has to be managed differently their life histories are are sim very very similar but have a little bit different dynamics mm -hmm. um, because it's a different area and you know um and just because it's a, an interesting thing about flounders, um, we started to talk just about their camouflage capability. So we have flounders here at the aquarium and you can see them change color even at, as quickly as um, a fish, a larger fish, because they typically rest on the bottom um, and they can change colors to uh, camouflage. And you can see them change even as quickly as a larger fish swimming over them and casting a shadow on them. So uh, they're, they're really pretty good at camouflage. They really are. They have great control of those chromatophores, the cells that allow them to change color. And it's really cool. If you ever catch one off a mud bottom, it'll be like, you know, really dark brown. And if you have a white boat, as soon as it hits the deck, it's like, bam, it's like really, really light shades, mm -hmm. extremely fast. I mean, they, they're really cool fish. I mean, I, you know, I've wondered too, they, I mean, they must have pretty good eyesight. Uh, in spite of their eyes being on top, they will match colors that are below them. They do. You know, we always, you know, I like to say that people always try to generalize what other things see based on all the five senses that we have and how mm -hmm. we perceive the world. But that flounder has an extremely powerful lateral line uh, system that goes through there, which are like sensory nerve cells. So it can really feel all kinds of vibration and everything around it. Uh, as well as probably has incredible eyesight. I usually, I like to think, uh, you know, what a fish's eyes do when it gets out of the water. It kind of tells you a little bit about uh, their eyesight and flounder are looking around everywhere and mm -hmm. they're changing colors based on what they see. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really, really neat. 
Um, and they also have an incredible sense of smell too, and that's probably how they're actually locating the different systems that they want to get back to is probably through uh, what you would call chemo reception. That they're actually mm -hmm. able to smell the chemistry of different bodies of water, which is, you know. That's remarkable. Yeah, I mean, if you try to put yourselves in the shoes of a flounder to be able to feel, see, mm -hmm. and smell like they do, I mean, it's probably an incredible sensory, uh, you know, organism down there. And it's obviously a top predator um, in the way in the way it operates and mm -hmm. it's really cool really important they're teeth yep and so the family that the southern flounder is paralictes paralictidae and that means the large toothed flounders and so they have really really big teeth and you can also see the that this fish has a gill opening and a fin on this side and on this side and the mouth opens this way but both of its eyes are on the left side of its face well, the other question I have before we kind of wrap up is if someone catches a, a flounder um, that has one of these tags, so it's clear that that fish has been tagged, yep. um, and they find one of these acoustic tags, I'm sure that you would probably like to recover that. Yes, um, I would, especially, and I'd like to get the carcass of the fish too, if possible. So I, I'm doing my own age and growth study with the otoliths, like we talked about, mm -hmm. and then a, a full repro study, so taking the ovaries. Uh, from all the females and getting them from every single month of the year and, and putting them on slides like histology like you would go get uh, at the skin doctor mm -hmm. and so you can look at maturity that way you can look at progression over the year um, and then at a certain point hopefully do fecundity to look at egg production um, in these fish and so to be able to get uh, not only those tags back but um, anything any information off the fish carcass is going to be really really beneficial to me and you know if the tag still has life in it I'll redeploy it and we can track mm -hmm. another fish with it. So what would you uh, request as far as getting the carcass like a, a, a phone call that comes in relatively quickly which interestingly relatively quickly, I mean, yes. tagging research has been around for a, longer than people have been carrying their phones with yep. them you know out <laughs> uh, when they're out flounder gigging or um, out but now you can maybe get that phone call pretty quickly and would you want you know the the carcass to be thrown on ice or how yeah. would you ideally want it to be handled if someone's yeah i mean if taking the, requests yeah if the fisherman does decide to harvest the fish which is as they're right uh they're more than welcome to do that they can knock the fillets off um which i'm sure that's why they kept the fish in the first place that's totally fine uh, and just put the carcass either on ice if you plan on getting it to me quickly or you can freeze it mm -hmm. and i'll come uh, get it as soon as possible so would you want the tags removed before they get frozen? Or? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the acoustic tag. I'm sure that uh, they would find that when they fillet it and they mm -hmm. can just put it in a Ziploc along with the, the external tag and that way I have both um, and the information. And so, but you know, anglers in Alabama generally uh, know a lot about this project because we've been able to get a lot of exposure on it. And so any of the double tagged individuals that are big, they know that they're pretty much carrying an acoustic tag. So we have had a few recap uh, and that were selected okay. to be released but when it comes to you know fish coming back in the spring we did have you know some people harvest fish uh that were acoustically tagged and it was really neat you know still to see that mm -hmm. um, and get that information back from those fish and then a couple of times there is some uh tag loss sometimes with those t-bar tags if there's just a single tag fish and so i had luckily it was one of the guides in alabama found the transmitter and a fish that was unmarked mm, uh, because wow. it had lost its tag mm -hmm. and uh called it in that way so what part of the fish does this go into? Uh, it goes into the abdomen. So we developed, or I developed a kind of a unique uh, minimal surgery to where, and it was specific placement after studying the anatomy of this fish that you can put that. Uh, and it seems to work really, really well. The fish, um, pretty much 100% of them live and move around and do just fine. And I've actually recaptured a few, a uh, few weeks after I tagged them and it's like completely healed up. And can so never I assume you have tell. to do that pretty quickly. Oh yeah, yeah. I can do it in about 45 seconds. So oh, okay. I've gotten really good at it. Yeah. But yes, you want to be very fast, very minimal. Um, you don't want to. to you want the, the fish, fish to out. survive. Exactly, especially if you're going to put a $400 transmitter. Right. In it yeah. And chunk it back, you know. Mm -hmm. But we do take we take really good care of our fish that we we're doing. You know, we don't do this with any fish that are kind of gut hooked or anything like that. Um, and then we also, after I tag them, we keep them for a few minutes, 15, 20 minutes, and make sure they're all good, and then go to release them, make sure they kick off strong. So, so um, 
you mentioned the like the ca like the catch rate or the catch limit for the commercial fishery. Mm -hmm. What what is the commercial fishery like? Like, so if you have a commercial license, you are allowed to harvest forty. Now now it's forty uh, fish per day at the, at the fourteen inch minimum, um, and you can you have a number of different ways that you can do that. You can do it with hook and line. You can do it uh, by gigging fish. Um, if you have a gillnet license, I think you can do it that way as well. Um, but you know, all that information still has to be, if you're harvesting mm -hmm. fish with commercial licenses, has to be reported for landings. Um, yeah, I just think that's kind of, it's a very different picture. It is, yes. The, the commercial fishery of flounder is a very different process than a uh, commercial fishery for a lot of fish. Right. So you're talking about like individuals maybe who are going out and they're catching a lot of flounder and they're selling them to local seafood restaurants or markets. Right. You know, on the East Coast, they have a very significant pound net fishery for them. And uh, I haven't actually seen that in person, so it'd be hard for me to describe it. But they take a lot of fish that way. And um, they have some issues and complaints with that as well and, mm -hmm. and everything. But, uh, you know, I think gill nets used to be one of the preferred methods that's kind of being phased out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people who have that are really good at it and pursue it for a living do it actually with hook and line which is incredible they go mm -hmm. out and catch 40 flounder in a day mm -hmm. you know oftentimes by themselves but it is an important part of you know it's a lot of fish that come out of the system but you know we want to see fish flounder on restaurants you know a lot of people want to be able to go mm -hmm. experience flounder that way you know to get it served to you on a restaurant mm -hmm. a lot of people you know it's a difficult fish to figure out learn how to catch and get for yourselves sometimes so mm -hmm. Uh, it's so important. I know you've you've said this and you were very clear about this, but sometimes people have the perception that um, you know, like fishery scientists are trying to do away with fishing, and yeah. so I, I I know that's why you keep reiterating that yeah. that um, that's not the goal. The goal is to to make sure that enough of these um, fish survive so that we can continue harvesting them. Right. I mean, I'm a huge fisherman mm -hmm. myself. It's if I'm not doing it for work, I'm usually doing it in my free time. But really it boils down to sustainability. You want to be able to keep a fishery in a state uh, to where you can harvest it at the maximum sustainable yield um, and not enter into an overfished state. So if you experience a bunch of overfishing uh, throughout period years, you may get to a state where your fish population is overfished. Mm -hmm. uh, and that overfished status simply means that the population is too low to regenerate a maximum sustainable yield. And so if you get into that state, then you, you're in a big, problem you can't rebuild the fishery very well and so it's about sustainability and ideally what i would like to see is it in a state of growth you know and so to be mm -hmm. harvesting at less than that maximum sustainable yield so the fishery continues to grow continues to get individuals fill out the different age classes um, and then you know once you get it to a really really healthy state that way it's a lot harder to screw it up mm -hmm. than it is when you continually put tons of pressure on it every year um, well, but, and the research also will kind of inform where you can make those changes, um, you know, so that you can get that maximum sustainable yield um, from fishing without, you know, and, and so you're not just kind of guessing. The managers are not taking, taking a shot, shot, at the dark, shot in the dark or, or overprotecting or underprotecting them. It's very tar trying to, to target the protections. Right. And, you know, we kind of, I've seen that actually, you know, with 2021, the recovery kind of came out of nowhere. Um, and the fishery was just lights out all year. Um, whereas this year, people were more prepared for it. They wanted to go harvest fish. And so there was a lot more pressure put on the fishery. And, I, you know, we saw some effects of that. Um, but at the same time, it was still much better than it has been in years past. But what, So what do you mean by that? People weren't successful in getting fish so they you know the, no, the effort wasn't there or no they were really successful in getting them and that that in you know, 2020 you no in lights out in 2021 it was the fishery i mean from what we saw on the water every day i mean there were flounder everywhere mm -hmm. literally you, you could pick a new spot that you'd never fished before pull up and just catch flounder after flounder after flounder and the people that were on the water were experiencing that as well. And but that you you think was maybe a um, a result of the protections and the year or so before that yep. you weren't seeing and that. And kind of you know, mm -hmm. after seeing how fast these fish grow with the growth rates and stuff from the recaptures, it, it make it kind of made sense. And uh, 
you know, once word gets out, and then a lot of pressure comes back into the fishery. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, 2019, 2020, people kind of weren't even trying for That's fun. That's what right? I was curious was about. They weren't trying because they weren't getting a lot of yield for their effort. Yeah, I mean, you're going to pick another fish to go yeah. try to fish for and harvest rather than spending eight hours to get full yeah. of flounder, you know. Right. Whereas now you can go out and catch, you mm -hmm. know, your limit sometimes, which uh, five fish is still a significant, you know, if you fill your bag limit, yeah. that's, that's really, you did a great job. So the pressure diminished in, re in, in response to the population decline because it's just not, yeah. not I mean, worth fishing, that much effort. Yeah, and fishing then, pressure yeah. is going to increase because it, it's correlated with effort. Right, so the higher yeah. your effort, the higher your fishing pressure mm -hmm. and your fishing mortality. And so... You know, that's why I still urge caution for people. I mean, get out, definitely enjoy the resources. I do it several times a year. I go out and I harvest my bag lemon and, mm -hmm. and I eat flounder, uh, put them in the freezer. I, or I love Oh, flounder. yeah. I and mean, you should. That's why there's a bag lemon, you know, and um, the fishery can support that. That's what it's meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no reason to go out and harvest a bunch of them all the time and let them, mm -hmm. you know, dry rot in your freezer or whatever, you know. I mean, it's it's about doing it responsibly and then when you run out you go out and you do it again and that's mm -hmm. that's part of the enjoyment about it and mm -hmm. making sure that the resources are there for the next generation is, is something i really believe in and uh kind of why i do what i do i guess but so to to wrap up what what kind of would you like to leave folks with i mean i guess just that message the you know we've got somewhat of a recovery now going on in the fishery we don't know uh how sustainable that's going to be over time. We hope that it is, um, but hope you also learn something about the unique life history of, of flounders, how they spawn offshore and their larvae comes in, they metamorphosize and have that environmental sex determination. And uh, the ones that are females are the ones you're going to eventually uh, probably be eating. You know, maybe you might eat a male. Males really kind of top out at 14 inches. They don't get a whole lot bigger than that. So we'll have to check back in with you a little later and see what else you're finding. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I get all the data downloaded, I should have some really, really cool information from yeah. 2021. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for chatting with yeah, us. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us.